So today's lesson is about, at the very top of your outline, wealth and financial health. Okay? Now the good news is, it's not about giving. Amen. The bad news, it's worse. All right? So, so we're going to have a little fun with this. And so at the very top of your outline, um, we have the, the, the word transformed. So we're in a series on transformed. If you missed any of the messages, um, there are CDs on the way out. I'm not sure if they're in there, but you're welcome to grab them. It says $1.50. Don't worry about it. Just take what you got to take. And you can always listen online as well if you're watching online. So transformed, uh, the word metamorphosis describes a change uh, from within. The world wants to change our mind by exerting pressure from the outside, and we all experience that on a regular basis. But God wants to transform our life from within, and how is he going to do that? He's going to do that by the renewing of our mind, all right? And then Romans chapter 12, we've been talking about this throughout the series, and then it says, uh, verse 1, it says, Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. In other words, don't let the world shape you, all right? And and it goes on and it says, um, uh, but be transformed, and we always ask how, by the renewing of our mind, and then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and what is it? His perfect will, all right? And so we've been looking at that verse throughout the series and uh, so we got this week, one more week, and then a we'll wrap up, Lord's Supper, then we get into Christmas. Aren't you excited about that? Yay, yeah. Hee-hee. All right. If you have your Bibles, 1 Timothy, and then we're going to be in chapter 6. So are you guys in a good mood? Because you're going to have to play along today for part of the message, okay? <clears throat> so I talked to a good friend of mine who's a pastor, and he was telling me about his people. Everyone look up here, please. We're following along? Yeah. All right. So he was telling me a little bit about the hearts of his people. And I'm like, wow, this is, pretty, this is pretty impressive. And it reminded me of what Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 6. And it's in your outline there. And it says, but godliness with, what is it, church? With, with contentment. And it, it is what? Great gain, right? For... Um, for we brought nothing into the world. Anybody been in the area of where birth happens? They're born naked, all right? And we can take nothing out of it, right? There's no U-Hauls following the hearse anywhere. Verse 8. <clears throat> but if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Verse 9. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and trap. Uh, uh, and, and a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. Verse 10, uh, for the love of money is the root, right? So money isn't the problem, it's the love of it, is the root of all kinds of evil. <clears throat> Some people eager to, uh, for money have wandered from their faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Verse 11, But you, Laurel Ridge, not my buddy's church, but you, men and women of God, flee all of this and pursue righteousness and godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Verse 12, fight the good fight of faith. Verse 15, God, uh, God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, and and we'll stop right there, okay? So Paul writes to Timothy, and Timothy is his understudy. He's an apprentice, okay? And and so Paul writes to Timothy, and he tells Timothy, Timothy, there will be times in your ministry where you are going to talk to people who have a little bit of wealth. Now, pause here for a moment. Now, obviously, the scripture is God-breathed, so... God, Paul isn't writing it. it he's under the, the, the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. So when God writes the scripture, not only is it for that context, but it's also for our context today. So when the scripture is written, it's for then, but it also projects into future uh, as well for us today. And now in those days, believers were not wealthy at all. 
They were poor. Many of them were disowned by their family members. Some of them had converted from Judaism and they lost all their security net. Some of them left pagan religions and, uh, and stepped in to follow Christ and they lost their connections that way. And so by you know, kind of a total picture of the New Testament church at that time, it was in- incredibly poor. They did not have a lot. But Paul isn't writing about amount of money. He's writing about the hearts of believers, okay? And, and so he tells them that, which we're going to see in a moment, that how you handle your money is really a picture of your spiritual condition. So if you sit here today and you're kind of like, I wonder what my spiritual condition is, then Scripture uses money for you to evaluate where you're at in your spiritual journey in your life. And so he says, by the very nature of wealth, whatever that wealth looks like, right? By the very nature of wealth, the tendency is for our heart to drift away from God. That's what he says, that some have walked away from it, and to become discontent with the things that we have. Now, that sounds opposite. Because you think about it, well, I thought that what the world says, which is not the one we're supposed to follow, says that if you just get enough money, you'll be happy and you'll be content. And yet it's not the case. And so in your outline, all believers are stewards given the responsibility to protect and to manage what the Lord has given them, whether it's a little or whether it's a lot, okay, that God has given it to you and you are simply to be a wise steward, okay? So number one in your outline is what is the danger of wealth, okay? So now play along with me. I talked to a friend of mine who's a pastor. Are y'all with me? All right. And he began to tell me a little bit about his people. And and, and he began to tell stories. So letter A in your outline is that wealth can cause people to, uh, to feel unhappy and dissatisfied that wealth can it's like well wait a minute what so so my buddy who's a pastor begins to tell me that that, that in his leadership team that, that he actually has a guy that taught him a spiritual lesson that's obviously in scripture and that is when you have an appetite for money it grows and it grows not your money the appetite for it And it becomes your lowercase g God that you believe in and you begin to worship it. And that what appetite for stuff does is it increases. So just as our natural desire to eat, if you feed an appetite, it grows. If you starve an appetite, which is kind of a thing today where the people are fasting, it shrinks right? So, so, so it is in, in the area of finances, that, that, when you, that when you desire more, then you have a hunger for more. And what you have isn't enough. You're not happy. You're not satisfied with it. And so what do you do? You desire more stuff, right? And that more stuff breeds more stuff and so on. So my buddy who's a pastor tells me about a guy in his leadership team. He's like, dude, you will not believe this. And I'm like, what's up? He goes, a guy on my leadership team, all right, he had a a, a car that was in perfect condition. And I'm like, perfect condition? It had three wheels or four wheels? He goes, no, all four of them and the spare tire was pumped up. You don't have one of those, right? And he said, it was paid off. It looked absolutely wonderful, And he desired, hold on to this because I know this isn't you, and he desired to take it to a dealership and trade it in for a newer model with a little less mileage and almost the same thing. I'm like, dude, hold on. You're telling me that he had a car that was paid off, that was in perfect condition, and he drove it to the dealership, and he left that car paid off in perfect condition with four tires all aired up and the spare that worked, and he left it there, and he drove away a new car, and he left his old car plus a boatload of money. He goes to say, and he, he says, yeah. I'm like, whoa, I got to sit down. 
this is too much for me. I, I can't handle it. I said, dude, I don't know how God has aligned you to be in that church, but, man, those people, their heart is far from God. I mean, how could they even possibly do it? He goes, it gets worse. And I'm like, worse? He said, yeah. He said, if you know anything about trading something in, you have like poor value, decent value, you know, okay, good or excellent, and then superior. And he said, the guy doing the appraisal comes in and he says, that car's in very good condition. And he's like, oh, it's not in very good condition. That car is in excellent condition. And I'm like, wait a minute. So he traded a car in that he considered in excellent condition for another car in excellent condition to leave it there to pay a boatload of money and to drive away. And he said, yeah. And I said, is that guy even saved? Does he know Jesus? Can he even say, Jesus is Lord? He goes, I don't know. I said, I would start right there. Because I don't know how a heart of a person could do such a thing. And I said, hey man, all I know is God divinely placed me in this church 31 years ago and none of my people would not even come close to even considering doing something like that. Amen? Amen. And he goes, it gets worse. I'm like, worse? How can that be worse? You're, you're leading a bunch of pagans. He goes, it's worse. He said, I was, I was at a women's thing, and I was just had some do, things to do in my office, and I happened to cruise out there, and I kind of got stuck in the corner, and I didn't want to make this, so I just kind of hid in the corner, and I overheard some conversations. And I'm like, really? What did they say? He said, well, there were some ladies in there, and they were talking about getting rid of some of their appliances in their kitchen and getting new ones. And I said, well, Obviously, I mean, the stuff breaks. And they go, oh, no, no, it didn't break. It still ran. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Wait a minute. This is too much for me. So they got rid of the appliances that worked. The ice maker, the freezer, the refrigerator, everything worked? Yeah. And I'm like, what did they buy? He goes, they bought a new refrigerator. And I'm like, they had a refrigerator. Yeah, but this one's different. This one has a board on it. And when you take something out of it, it notifies Amazon. And he asked me, he goes, you know what Amazon is? I said, yeah, it's a river. <laughs> and I see them all over the place and they advertise the river everywhere they drive. I said, it's unbelievable. They have more agents than anyone that I know of. And he goes, yeah, it's crazy. So when they pull out the milk, it notifies them and a drone lands a gallon of milk the same day. I'm like, that's nuts. But wait a minute. That thing worked and they got rid of it. He goes, yeah, and I'm in. I said, maybe you need to have a revival and you need to have a come forward invitation because you have a lot of people that need Jesus in their heart. And he goes, I was thinking about that. He goes, it's worse, Pastor Dan. I'm like, worse than that? I said, this is full on, you know, like the worst crowd ever. And he goes, yeah, it's worse. He said, a couple pulled me aside and they had overheard that another couple in the church had no clothes to wear to church. And he said, we're not one of those churches that let naked people in. And I said, well, that, so we believe in the same thing, right? Because it's never a good idea to have people naked in the auditorium. And he said, he said, so I heard them and I promised them that I would not, you know, say anything. But I was going to go over to the family that had no clothes to wear to church. 
and kind of help them out. And I said, well, that's cool. That's great. And he said, so I have a friend that works at the St. Vincent de Paul. And when somebody is in need, if I give them my business card, they go down there and they show the manager. And the manager will let them have some clothes for free. They don't even charge them. And I said, oh, that is very cool. And he said, but before I do that, I'm going to go visit them to just kind of get an idea of what kind of clothes they might want to have. And he said, so I went over to their house and I sat down and I just said, you know... I just overheard something, and I'm concerned for y'all, and you guys don't have any clothes to come to church. Now, you know, we're not judgmental, and it's all good, and, you know, we, we just want to help you out. Can, can I kind of see maybe what you may have to kind of get an idea of how, how some of the ladies might help you? And so they took me into their bedroom, which was a little weird, okay, and I walked back in there, and there was a room in their bedroom that was bigger than most people's houses, and in it, they had rods every... They had more racks than the rack store had. And in there, the clothes were so tight that they couldn't even open their, their coat hangers to get the clothes. I said, so they had clothes. And he said, yeah, so many clothes, they couldn't even open it. But they had nothing to wear. And I said, wow. I said, I'll, you know... I just think back about God's sovereignty in my life and I think of how God has placed me in this church and the circumstances that all worked out. And I said, dude, all I know is I'm going to pray for your church and for the heart of your, your people because my people's heart wouldn't even come close to such a thing as that. Or would it? Isn't it interesting how easily it is that our hearts migrate away from trusting God fully and completely. And isn't it interesting how we can rationalize and justify doing things financially because somehow we think whatever in, in, in truth is, and we'll, we'll get to it in a moment, it, it's okay if you buy a car, but isn't it interesting how we'll think that that will make our life better and it doesn't. And then what's funny is we'll turn around and do the same thing over the next month, won't we? It's like, it's like we don't learn, right? Because wealth has this, in all of us, an appetite. And, and when our heart migrates away from trusting God fully and completely, it's never enough. And it's always more, and it's always more, and it's always more. And it's like an appetite that you just keep eating and it just keeps feeding it. And see, Paul's point here isn't about people and how much money they have because, because your heart can be right and you could be a bazillionaire and your heart can be wrong and you could be poor. It's about your heart's condition and recognizing who is the provider for you and to recognize and to look to ultimately God in your life. So letter B in your outline is wealth can cause people to think that if I have more, I will be wealthy and happy. So uh, uh, Gallup did a poll, this is prior to COVID, and he took basically people who made different amounts, 30 to 35 or 30 to 40,000. He asked them, what would wealthy be? And they doubled it. They said 70 to 80,000. He asked people that made $75,000, how much would you need to make in order to be wealthy? They said $150,000. So then they went to people who made $150,000 and they said, how much would you need or do you consider yourself wealthy? And they said, we're not wealthy, right? Because it's never enough. It's always, we're always moving forward. And, and so they came out and they did a survey and they said people who were asked the question, well, how much liquid assets would you need to have in order to be wealthy? And they said $5 million in liquid assets, which is about eight gallons of gasoline. <laughs> There's your liquid assets right there, Right? And so my hunch is, is if you were to ask people that made 10 or had $10 million in liquid assets, guess what they would say? No, it's not enough, right? So, so we're, we're always desiring to, to, to have more. So we're never happy. We're never healthy. We're never in a, in a good place. So Paul goes on in verse 17, and he says, command those who are rich 
And the word command is the word instruct. So instruct those who are rich in this present world. And, and, then, and then he, in number two in your outline, is he's going to warn them about their spiritual condition. And he says uh, how, how wealth and your spiritual condition and some warning shots. So letter A in your outline is that wealth causes Christ followers to pull away from depending on God. And this is his point right? This is his point that he's concerned about it. And and so he says, command those who are rich in this present world. And then verse 17 goes on and says, not to be arrogant. And we'll stop right there, right? In in other words, that what wealth does when our heart begins to move away, that God is your provider, what wealth does is it makes you think that you're somebody, right? And, And we see this all the time. Right? Whether it's sports players and movie stars and actresses and actors and all that kind of stuff, that somehow they think because they have a lot of money that it makes them smarter. Have you ever heard some of the things that they say? Right? The truth is, you could go into the preschool room with three year olds and you could get more wisdom from them than you get from these knuckleheads. Right? But somehow the world says, if you're rich, you have something to say. Right? That somehow as your bank account goes up, your IQ goes up. Right? Which isn't the case. Right? And we know that. We know that because all you have to do is turn on the internet. You can see a bunch of people who are, who are not, you know, very, very bright at all. Right? And, and so when we begin to get arrogant, right? And that, that the verb means to look down your nose upon someone else. That we begin to think that we earn it. That we made it that it's ours. And then I become the person in charge of my own destiny. And the stuff that I have belongs to me and I'm the owner of it and I'm the maker of it and I'm it. And when our heart begins to do that, it's just simply drifting away from where God's desire is for us to be. And so when we look at our job and we look at our education and we look at different areas of our life and we think that's it, it's just, again, it's a picture of your spiritual life. And it's just a point where you've got to recognize that you begin to, to slide away. It begins to slide away. Where, where arrogance is the opposite of humility. Humility is, God, I'm a knucklehead, and you bless me. Right? I, 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 that's it. And, and that's a far better place to be than to think that you're somebody Right? When, when reality, everything that God has given you, your breath, your heart, your IQ, everything, it belongs to him. And you're that steward of that. But when you begin to hold on to it, then, then all of a sudden you become, uh, you, you, you find yourself in a bad spot. So he goes on and he says, uh, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Does anybody want to talk about the stock market today? Right? So, so, so the, you, those of you who follow it, you know, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Right? The market's up, the market's down. The market's up, the market's down. Right? The economy's good, the economy's bad. Interest rates are up, interest rates are down. If you put all that in, all your hope into that, then you're going to find yourself in a bad spot. So the proverb writer says this. <clears throat> Will you set your eyes upon wealth? Then suddenly, and this is the amplified version, then suddenly, where is it? It's gone, right? For riches certainly make themselves wings, right? Red Bull's commercial, got wings. Like an eagle that flies toward the heavens. In other words, it's here and it's gone. Proverbs 18, 11 says, the wealth of the rich is a fortified city, and we'll stop at the semicolon. In, in other words, in those days, you, you, if you were in a, a secure city, you had walls around your, your, your city. And then in front of it, you had one entrance in and one entrance out. And this is why in Revelation it says there are no gates because there's no bad people in heaven. And, and so you had military out in front, and you would build up your walls, and that would prevent the bad people from coming in and attacking you. And he he says, the rich people think that way. The rich people think that if they can build their walls up high enough, that it is going to be unscalable, okay? Now, he uses the word imagine. He says, they imagine it's unscalable. And the word imagine means vapor, right? In other words, it's here, 
right? We had some smoke a little bit. It's here, it's gone, right? So, so the, the rich person thinks that they are secure, but in reality, it's here for a moment, and then it just disappears. And so when we begin to think that if I just have whatever that number is, that everything is going to be okay, again, I love you all, but it just shows that your heart is migrating away from trusting in your provider. Because it's not like you wake up on Tuesday and go, I think I'm trusting my 401k from now on right? You don't do that because it's not something that you make a decision out loud, but your heart begins to draw away from it. And, and all of a sudden you find yourself. Now, now the problem is, is how much is enough, right? So, so in your outline, and this is a question that you'll oftentimes hear people, how much would you need to secure the future? And I know the answer to that. So get ready to write it down. The answer to that question is more than you currently have right now. Because what you have now, you start thinking about all the possibilities and you go, that ain't enough. So guess what you got to do? Got to get more. Right? Because you're thinking that that is your responsibility. You don't see God as the provider. You see yourself as the provider. And so you have to have more. And so you play the what if, or what if this happens, and what if that happens, and the kids, and the this, and that, and the grandkids, and what if, right? And so obviously, whatever you have, if it's nothing or a ton, it's not enough. And, and so, and so you, you end up needing more. And, and this is what's interesting about giving, and this is not giving in church necessarily, but even in charitable, charitable inst, uh, uh, organizations, that poor people, on the percentage give more money than rich people do. And that's an interesting thing, right? Now, you'll hear about so-and-so gave $10 million to whatever cause, and it's all over the news. The reality is hundreds of thousands of people gave 15 bucks, right? Now, now, the question is, is, why is that? Well, and here's what they determine. That poor people recognize that if you have $200 and you save $300, that that's not enough to secure your future. But if you save 200000 and you think 300000 is the answer, guess what you're not going to do? You're not going to give because you got to get to the 300000 The poor person knows <laughs> if I give 25 bucks of my $200 away, it's not going to help me out anyway. If the transmission goes out or there's some major health issues, it's not going to help anyway. And so, therefore, they're more generous, right? Now, now, now think about this. When we think about um, some, and I don't mean to make light of it, but you think about Steve Jobs, right? So he was one of the wealthiest guys in the world. He had built the richest company in the world at that time. He was one, the, the most successful CEO and, of Apple, right? And what happened to Steve Jobs with all of his billions of dollars? He died, So apparently, however much he had wasn't enough. It wasn't enough, right? No one sees billionaires walking around, right? Solomon would be a billionaire. Have you seen him lately? Right? He's not cruising around like, hey, look at there's Solomon. Dude, come here. You wrote some cool stuff. Let me talk. He's dead because there's never enough to save you. And, and, and what we recognize is we recognize that in our heart, but when our heart begins to drift, then we start struggling with it. And we think, well, maybe I just need to, right? And so there's, uh, in verse 17, he goes on, he says, put their, put their hope in God. So here's a couple things that you need to jot down. The chief competitor, and we talk about this in next steps, the chief competitor with your heavenly father is your money. And this is why Jesus spoke more about money than heaven, where you can go if you have a personal relationship with him, or hell, where you go where you don't have a personal relationship with him. Why would that be? The reason why is because he wants your heart. It's not the amount. He wants your heart. And and Jesus knows that wherever your treasure is, 
Your heart will be there, and that's what Matthew chapter 6 says. Now, here's what we're saying. Boy, I'm glad I don't have any treasures, Pastor Dan. I mean, I don't have a box somewhere that's filled with all kinds of gold bars. Here's what treasure means. Whatever your heart thinks of most often. You're like, "Uh uh-oh. What drives you? What do you wake up in the morning desiring? When you go to bed at night, what is it? See, it can be a person and it can be things. Right? So what is it? And Jesus says that where your heart is, right, that's where your treasure is. And Jesus wants your heart, so he wants to track down your treasure. So he says in verse 21, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Verse 24, no one, right, which means all of us in here, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he'll be devoted to one and he'll despise the other. In case you missed verse 24, you cannot serve God and money. It's impossible, right? Second one is in the world, wealth has become the substitute for God, And again, this is why we have athletes and movie stars and wealthy people and we pray them out to hear what they have to say, right? And unfortunately, what they say is what the world says. In many cases, which is not is a nonsense, and, and we really don't need to, to be, be paying attention to it. And, and so it, it's important that we begin to recognize that when money becomes our substitute, then we begin to distance ourselves from God. So in today's world, prior to COVID, the average church attender came to church on Sunday about 1.25, 1.125, depending on who you read, but about 1.25, okay? When I started my ministry 31 years ago, the average church attender attended about 3 point something, 3.2 times a month. What happened? right? Where, 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 did, where did the distraction come in, right? How, how, how was it? How, how, did, how did it all play out and work out? When we allow the world to conform us, then our heart begins to drift away from where God desires for us to be, right? And, 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 when, we, and when we begin to think about that, and we begin to think about our spiritual life, and where our heart is, Jesus says, well, where your treasure is, there's, there's your heart's going to be also, right? In, in, in a spirit, from a spiritual formation part, um, one of the things I learned early in my ministry is that my job as a shepherd is to position the people of the hearts, their hearts, where Jesus desires for them to be. And that, that was my key, make my key role. My, my job primarily isn't fighting the enemy, My job is trying to shepherd the hearts of the believers to be as close to Jesus as they possibly can. And the competitor to that, or my challenge to that, is wealth. Wealth is the one that is the struggle to get their attention in order to be where where they need to be in in their spiritual life, right? So in Proverbs, it says this, it says, keep falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Lord, bless me. The writer of Proverbs says, be careful. He says, but give me only my daily bread. Why? Verse 9. Otherwise, I might have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? You think that you're the provider. And, and all of a sudden, God takes kind of a back seat to it in our life as, as the wealth becomes a distraction to us in our life. Key truth in your outline, why would you put your hope in your riches when you can put your hope in the one who provides the riches? Okay, now I'm going to say something serious and then we're going to move on, all right? In my experience in life, and I've had maybe five or six opportunities from church folks um, to, to stay with their loved ones in, in, in an ICU, CCU unit as life support is removed. And many of them didn't want to be with their loved ones as they took, off, you know, took their last breath, and, but they wanted someone in the room with them 
to be with them that loved them and cared for their family. And so I was asked if I would, you know, would, would I be willing to do it? And I said, no, it's an honor to do that. And, and, here's, and here's what you know, but I'm going to just share with you just in case you don't. No one ever stopped me and said, Pastor, before we remove life support, let's just bust down Uncle Joe's 401k so we can once again look how many zeros are behind the comma. None of them ever do that. You know what they ask me? Explain to us in heaven, how will we know people when we have a relationship with Jesus? They look to their hope. They don't look to their stuff, right? Because they realize in that moment, their stuff means nothing. It means nothing to them. And so, so Paul's point is, as believers, we don't know when we're going to take our last breath, right? Some people, it's, they die instantly. Some people linger on. Right? So we don't know. So why would you live like your stuff is the answer when you can rely on the one who's the provider because you're going to rely on him in the future and you're going to ask Pastor Dan to tell us once again the blessed hope that we have. Why wouldn't you live that way now? Wealth becomes a substitute for God. The key truth as I said, is why would you put your, your hope in the, in the riches when you can put your hope in the one who provides? Letter B in your outline is wealth causes Christ followers to be distracted from God's priorities, right? Causes us to be distracted from God's priorities. <clears throat> when you think of third world countries, and some of you have gone on mission trips in third world countries, and they, they walk for miles, sometimes five and ten miles on a Sunday morning to go to a church that has a dirt floor, that has no sound system, that has no walls, has no smoke machine, has no trained pastors in many cases, which is probably why they're doing well, and has, you know, none of that stuff. And people will walk for miles to get there, to spend all day with their believing brothers and sisters in Christ and sing and worship and have a, an amazing time. Then we come into the United States, Canada, right? Even parts of Europe. And we ask ourselves, why is it that folks are so distracted? And the answer to that question is because wealth affords us the opportunity to be distracted. Wealth allows us, right? Wealth allows us to do things. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't do things. But wealth allows us to do things in third world countries. They have no idea what it's like. They just left a junk pile scavenging some food to take to church to eat. They're not worried about a, about a, about a refrigerator that links up and... To, to Amazon that delivers your milk, right? Their kids aren't in multiple uh, sports events, right? They're, they're not cruising all over the place, but we are. Now, hear my heart. God says that he provides us everything for our enjoyment, right? And that's in verse 17, so it isn't about that we can't have that stuff. The bigger issue is, where is our heart today? Is it being pulled away from it? Or is our heart right with where God desires for us to be? And, and, and what's interesting, and again, what's interesting is when, when an emergency happens, God has your attention and you're not distracted, are you? But when you're living your life on a regular basis, man, it's easy to get distracted. Hence why average church attendance is probably less than 1% on a Sunday. So they're projecting the average church attender is attending less than one time a month. Okay? So Paul writes in verse 17, and he says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but put their hope in God 
who richly provides, and so here, you know, here's the good news, who richly provides us everything for our enjoyment. So he doesn't care if you buy a new car. He doesn't care if you go down and get the new refrigerator with the whatever stuff in. He doesn't care that you look into your, your closet that's bigger than most people's houses and you have more clothes hanging up there and you have nothing to wear and you need to go buy a new outfit. He doesn't care about that. But he cares about your heart. So he provides for us, but not that our, our, our life will be distracted, but that we will focus on who he is. And so he gives us those things for our enjoyment. Verse 18, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds. And so now I'm talking to my church, not my buddy's church, and to be generous and willing to share, right? And, and so here he has, he has two, two parts. One is to do good and, 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 to be gener- and, and to be generous. And so to do good, the verb refers to noble and excellent, And it means that you're not doing good so that other people will praise you, but you're doing good in secret to bless someone else. Because that's what was given to you, that you are a conduit of uh, of things from God and you use it for the life of others. So you know the verse in, in the gospel where it says the right hand doesn't know what the left hand's doing and we thought that was about politicians? It is. It isn't. Okay, what it means is this, that when you do charitable work, when man or humans see it and praise you for it, that's your gift. If no one sees it, God gives you treasures in heaven, right? When we do our mission stuff, when we help families, it is an absolute rule. I don't want any notoriety, period, None. Because if we get the praise, and you'll see, and again, I love the other pastors. In my opinion, they're dead wrong. But when we have a write-up in the newspaper about all the great things that we're doing, that's your praise. I don't need the praise of men. I need the praise of God. So he says, to do good, to be generous and willing to share. Generous means bountiful not stingy. Now, this isn't just about finances. This is about your time. Hello, church, right? This is about the talents that God has given you as well as your resources in life. And so here's the big idea. The warning to believers is not to allow our wealth to cause us to lose sight that Jesus is our first priority, right? That we do not want wealth to do that. And and if wealth is going to do that, may I pray that the Lord will remove it so your heart is right with God? Wouldn't that be a crazy prayer to pray? So here it is. You ready? Gen Xers, 54%. Baby boomers, 51%. Millennials, 40%. People who live in houses, 42%. People who live in houses of 1,500 square feet to uh, 2,099 square feet, as well as people who live in houses 2,500 to 3,500 square feet. People who live in Idaho are 54%, or 50, 59% more, more likely. It's the Californians that moved there. <clears throat> Utah, 54% more likely. New Mexico, 53% more likely. New Hampshire, 49% more likely. And Wisconsin, 48% more likely. You want to know what you're more likely to have? A storage unit that you rent. Somebody just got elbowed. (laughs) February 2022. This is a business journal. This isn't like comedy or anything like this. Okay? The value of American storage units was, a, was, uh, was appraised at, 50, uh, at $51.32 billion. In 2027, so for those of you, about five years, $71.3 billion. All right? Now here's the funny part in my opinion. 
the average person puts in there um, furniture, appliances that don't link up to uh, Amazon, appliances, sporting goods, hobbies, hobby gear, and business items. And here's why they do it. To downsize their stuff. Pause. Not to downsize the footprint of their home, to downsize the stuff that they have in their footprint of their home. So when something moves out, are you following me? Guess what moves in? The same thing that you just moved out. Right? Now, now pause. And if you have a storage unit, it's, I'm fine with it. I have a huge house and I get it, okay? The key part isn't whether you have a storage unit. The key part isn't whether you're going to go home to the dealership on the way home and trade in your car. It's not that you're going to go down to Best Buy and get a new refrigerator that links up with whomever, right? That isn't the issue. The issue is your heart. Where's your heart? Do you see Jesus as your provider or not? It's Paul's point. My job is to make sure my heart's right and to encourage you to make sure that your heart's right. And may we leave here today recognizing that Jesus is our solution, He is our provider, and that we need to make sure that our heart is positioned where He desires for it to be. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and grace. Father, thank you for this time together, and I just recognize, Lord, that this message fits all of us, I'm sure. And Lord, we've all been in those places where we don't have anything to wear and where we're trading in stuff that works perfectly well. But Father, my prayer is moving forward today that our hearts would be right with you, that we would recognize you as the provider, not our education, not our job, not our business, not anything, but Jesus, you are our provider. And Lord, our hearts and our minds and our spirit looks to you as we walk out of here today. It's in Jesus' name I pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. So next week we're going to talk about vocation and we're going to learn a great country song. Johnny Paycheck, Yeehaw. take this job and... <laughs> <laughs>